So what's the argument for why now? I'm going to give you four. First of all, the technology has advanced to the point where we can monitor what's going on in forests and measure the, the changes in carbon uh, stocks and flows better than ever before. So on the left, you see um, an image that is made possible by MODIS satellite images where on uh, a cycle of 16 days, you can see where there are deforestation events happening with a reasonable uh, accuracy. It's temporarily, temp very high temporal resolution and a good enough spatial resolution. And so this uh, is the kind of technology that the Brazilians use to actually mobilize law enforcement efforts as part of the package of, of interventions that Artur was telling us about this morning that led to a decrease in the deforestation rate. On the right, we see Landsat imagery, which is uh, the, the technology and the ability to analyze that te technology and, and overlay the scenes has enabled us better than ever before to measure the changes on an annual basis of how much deforestation and regrowth has taken place, so as the basis of a monitoring system and potentially a, a payment for performance system. But I would argue that, that the value of this new technology goes above and beyond that sort of technical utility for making a, a red system work. It's actually catalyzing shifts in governance norms. I mean, basically, now that you have this eye in the sky, and as C4 did, you can, this is an image from a recent C4 blog, you know, sort of trace out where the concessions are, you know, based on the polygons and the satellite imagery, there's no place to hide. And so there's now increasing pressure on governments to to disclose the information they have, not only about forest covering condition, but who has the rights, you know, where are the con concession boundaries according to their records, which up to now have not been public documents, that allow for a more open, you know, citizen enforcement approach to um, keeping the uh, good guys on the, bad guys on the straight and narrow. A second reason is the Brazil story, and this is just a different version of the map that Artur showed you this morning about um, the deforestation rate over time, and you can see a dramatic fall starting at about um, 2004. These are, are images from Paulo Barreto at uh, Imazan. And what's interesting is when you overlay the soy and cattle price index with that, because for a while there, people were saying, oh, well, the only reason that the Brazilians are reducing deforestation is that commodity prices are low, and as soon as they go back up again, uh, the deforestation is going to go up too. Well, in fact, you can see that Brazil has succeeded in decoupling the deforestation rate from those commodity prices. Third reason why now is that a lot of people got dressed up and went to the altar um, at the Bali COP. And a lot of these red early movers, ranging from heads of state down to villagers, you know, thought the international community was going to, you know, deliver on this promise. And so they've invested a great deal in terms of personal political capital or investment in planning or deferring other, other land use decisions, getting ready for red. So you had uh, President Yuno Yono of Indonesia being the first um, developing country leader to step forward and make some ambitious uh, commitments to reduce emissions, and most of those were going to be coming from reduced emissions from deforestation. Uh, Calderon spoke at an event in uh, um, Cancun where he departed from his prepared remarks and was pounding on the pulpit, you know, talking about the underlying drivers of deforestation. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Uh, you know, but we had heads of state really putting their, 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 their imprimatur on this. And again, as I say, a lot of local communities as well. Well, you know, these guys have been waiting around for six years now. And um, a, a former red negotiator has characterized this as a narrative of disappointment gradually setting in. And I think there's a, a rapidly closing window to turn that narrative around before it will be sufficiently sunk in that it will be very difficult to change. The third reason is, uh, it's the fourth reason is that um, we have an opportunity, and this is where this new project at, at Center for Global Development comes in, to marry two areas of analysis and experience that remarkably have not come together before. And that is the, all the work that Center for Global Development and others have done on this cash on delivery aid approach, you know, a payment for performance approach in other sectors like education and, and, and health delivery. And then on the other side, all of the research that's gone into trying to figure out how red would work. Well, both have the same challenges, you know, how do you set a baseline, how do you measure progress, what are the payment modalities, you know, all that stuff. Some of them are going to be easier in other sectors, some of them are going to be harder, but there's plenty to learn between the two. And we're going to make it our business to try to, to draw those lessons out. So I see that as a real opportunity.